You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello, good morning and welcome back to another live edition of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by 90 Min. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon, and on this edition, we're going to be discussing the latest Arsenal-related transfer rumours. We're going to continue the fallout to the game yesterday and we're going to be taking your questions from the live comments. I want to say a big hello uh, to those of you joining us live already. Big hello uh, to Inter who starts off with a lovely comment, <laughs> we are effed for this season. Uh, Book Sahar joins us from sunny Dubai. Hope you're well, my friend. Uh, Sonny De Niro says, happy Monday, Harry. Big hello to uh, Wandering Minstrel. How you doing? Hope you're well. Uh, big hello to Bad Boy Junior Gunner, Kebab Abdi, Josh Walhad. Hope you guys are all good. Um before we kind of get into the rumours and the latest stories, and we're going to talk a little bit about Joe Willock, because, of course, the news broke after we finished recording the episode yesterday that that deal is in place for Joe Willock to join Newcastle United. I think we kind of gathered that and guessed that, didn't we, off the back of the fact that he wasn't included in the squad against Spurs. And, of course, Mikel Arteta's comments post-match pretty much gave it away uh, that Joe Willock was uh, Newcastle bound and that deal is very close to being completed from what we understand. But as I say, before we do go into that, I just want to address a few comments because I know there's a lot of people in the chat that are kind of looking at, at things and going, you know, here we go. This one from Wild had genuinely someone tell me one reason why any Arsenal fan should be positive going into next season, because I genuinely couldn't name you a single reason. Uh, Inter, uh, Still holding on to that comment I made about armchair managers. All we got told us was we are negative armchair managers over the top, not supporters, etc. The list goes on. People just didn't want to listen. Absolutely embarrassing. No, let's clear that up because being negative is overreacting to a friendly draw against Hibernian. Being negative is overreacting uh, to the defeat against Chelsea last week at Emirates Stadium. Being a negative is overreacting to the fact that we lost to Spurs in a preseason friendly, a game that doesn't matter. If you've got concerns and frustrations about the fact that, in your opinion, the team are not ready for the Premier League season with just a few ga- uh, days to go, then that is fair. That's not being negative. That's having a genuine criticism. And a lot of the time, the difference between being negative and being, um, you know, fair is is just the way that you put that opinion across. You know, if it's like, oh, Arsenal are shit, Arsenal are this, we're screwed, et cetera, et cetera, all the time, it does get a little bit draining. It does become a little bit negative. And I'm not really sure why people go down that route. I want to hear problems and I want to hear solutions to those problems. That's constructive criticism and that's what I want to hear from from some of you guys in the chat I'm not you know I'm not for a second saying that Arsenal are ready Arsenal are prepared I'm as frustrated as anybody else I I had a little bit of a wobble didn't I last week on the podcast where I talked I thought quite passionately about all the things that I I felt were an issue going into the new season the fact that we're a couple of days closer now uh, makes that even worse makes it feel even worse it amplifies it and um, yeah, look, there are major, major concerns ahead of the Premier League kickoff. And we're going to come on to address some of those in a little bit. But before we do that, let's dig into some of the transfer stuff. Now, I mentioned Joe Willock. He is Newcastle United bound. And I think that although on social media there's been quite a bit of clamour about this and there's been a lot of Arsenal fans who are actually quite opposed to the fact that, that Joe Willock is being allowed to leave the club, there are others who think that £25 million is not a reasonable fee, that we probably could have got a bit more. I'm not so sure about that. I I tweeted it yesterday because I had people kind of, you know, I always get the same reply from people. It's, well, Rian Brewster joined Sheffield United for however much it was. But just because Sheffield United, as I've said before, had their pants pulled down over Rian Brewster, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to fall for that, especially at a time like this. We're, We're talking about clubs who have been impacted by the pandemic. We're talking about a very, very different transfer market at the moment. Everybody pretty much has been affected, barring the the clubs 
like Man City, like Chelsea, you have their sugar daddies throwing money at them. Um, but yeah, look, I think 25 million is a reasonable fee for Joe Willock. I think it's a good fee, in fact. I think that it's a deal that works for everybody. I, I really don't see uh, why there is so much opposition to it. Arsenal clearly need the money to be able to bring in some of the players that we feel we need going into the new season. Joe Willock, interestingly, has scored eight of his nine total Premier League goals in a Newcastle United shirt. So you've got to consider that prior to him going to St. James's Park. He hadn't really broken through and made enough of an impact for Arsenal to be demanding any mere more than £25 million. And that's the way you got to look at it. People were, were mentioning to me on Twitter, oh, he's got nine Premier League goals. Yeah, but eight of them came on loan at Newcastle, which means that prior to joining Newcastle, he hadn't done enough just yet to A, establish himself in the Arsenal team, to B, um, you know, be regarded as a, a top, top player. And then subsequently, that means you can't then go and demand 30, 35, 40 million pounds for him. I just think anybody who's kind of gone with that sort of valuation is, is going way over the top. I think it's a crazy amount to be talking about with Joe Willock. I think he's a player that's got potential. He's a player that's got ability. And often in the transfer market, as I always say, you do pay over the odds for potential. And it is a risk. It is a gamble because you don't know necessarily that they're going to fill that potential or fulfill, sorry, that potential. So it is a worry um, if you're the club spending that kind of money. 25 million, if I were a Newcastle fan, I'd probably feel is maybe slightly over the top. It's okay because of that potential and it's okay because of what he could be. But Newcastle have taken a big gamble on Willock here because from what we're told, that is pretty much Newcastle United's transfer budget for the summer. And they've decided to spend it on Joe Willock in bringing him to the club. They see him, as I've said before, as a long-term investment. That's why they've gone out on a limb to do it. We talk about the figure of £25 million. There are reports that it's about £22 million up front and £3 million of that will come in add-ons later on, although I cannot confirm that because I don't know it for sure. Um and there's also some reports, I think Chris Wheatley was one of them, and uh, forgive me if I'm attributing this to the wrong person, but I'm pretty sure uh, that it was Chris Wheatley who reported uh, that Arsenal have included a sell-on clause in there as well. And if that's the case, uh, then that feels like a good bit of business as well, just to safeguarding ourselves in the event that Joe Willock does go on to become a top, top player. Are Arsenal fans worried about this because they've got a little bit of a hangover over the Emi Martinez thing? You know, of course, Emi Martinez left the club. Um, again, he was a player who showed some real quality in a really short, condensed space of time. And that obviously led to clubs having interest in him. Um, obviously, we didn't get as much money for, for Emi Martinez as we, we are with Joe Willock. And then people have looked at how Martinez has progressed and how he's been pretty good in between the sticks for Aston Villa and are kind of really, you know, worried about this happening again. The reality is, whatever way you look at it, for me anyway, Joe Willock is not a starter at Arsenal Football Club. He's not going to be a starter. He's not part of the plans. I've talked about it time and time again, how stylistically he just doesn't fit in what Mikel Arteta is trying to do. Rightly or wrongly, look, Mikel Arteta might be leading us down the wrong path. Mikel Arteta might be wrong in the way that he's setting up the team. We're going to find that out, aren't we, very, very soon. But if he's not part of your plans and you clearly need to do further business, how can you turn down an offer of £25 million? We've talked about Granit Xhaka, an imperative part of our team last season. We tried to shift him and we couldn't even get £20 million for him. We couldn't get anywhere near the asking price. Hector Bayer in another player that Arsenal wanted to move on and clearly can't do it because the right offers are not coming in. Therefore, you've kind of been pushed into a corner here with Joe Willock, where even if there were some doubts about whether it was the right decision to let him go or not, it's so abundantly clear that Arsenal need to do business in other areas that they simply cannot say, no, we're not taking it. Um, you know, it is good money. It is good. It's a good deal for everybody. As I said right at the beginning, it's a good deal for Arsenal because they get the money in for Joe Willock, which can then be used in the transfer market to acquire perhaps more priority targets. It's good for Joe Willock because he's going to play regular Premier League football at a club that he already knows that he's comfortable at 
and hopefully his career is going to kick on and he's going to develop a little bit more. And it's a good deal for Newcastle United, who are crying out for that type of player. They'll feel that they know what Joe Willock is about, having had him at the club in the second half of last season. And so for everybody, whichever way you look, this deal, to me anyway, makes good sense. And I'm not going to be beating the club up over this one. There are plenty of things you can beat them up over right now, but that is not one of them, in my opinion. I uh, just want to quickly, uh, before I forget to do this, because I will forget if I don't say it now, I just want to congratulate Arsenal's Gabriel Martinelli, of course, winning the gold medal at the football with Brazil, beating Spain in the final. So fair play and congratulations to Gabriel Martinelli. Always good to see one of our own uh, lifting or win. I don't know, do you call it a trophy or is it it's just medals, isn't it, in the Olympics? But you know what I mean? Uh, congratulations to Gabriel Martinelli and Brazil on that. Now, I want to touch on some other transfer rumours, which we'll do in a moment, but I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about Mikel Arteta's post-match uh, press conference comments following that game against Spurs. And look, I think with, um, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to press conferences, I think you've always got to read between the lines a little bit. I think there are certain things that managers just simply don't say. I think it's very, very easy as a as a fan who maybe doesn't work in the industry to start digging out the journalists and saying, well, you should have asked him this, or you should have asked him that. And look, a lot of the time you may ask the difficult questions and you'll put them across in a, in a certain way. And you just won't get the response that you want. You're going to get a PR tailored response. If you think these managers don't know what they're going to be asked a lot of the time, when they walk into press conferences, you're living on another planet because they do. They anticipate what's coming. They've got press officers. They know exactly what is going to be thrown at them in each and every press conference. And they work out how they're going to answer those questions accordingly. So when you listen to something said in a press conference, you do always have to take it with a pinch of salt because if you're sensible enough, you'll realize that a lot of what they're saying is a toned down, safe version of what they probably actually want to say. And I think I've seen quite a few people on social media sort of giving some of the journalists, some of the really reputable ones that, that cover on Arsenal shit on social media about the questions that they've asked and saying, you know, uh, why didn't you ask this or why didn't you ask that? Let me just say from someone who's been in the position of a press conference on, on multiple occasions, been lucky enough to ask questions myself, it's if you're a journalist, like I, I'm not a traditional journalist, right? My job is a little bit different. I talk about Arsenal rather than reporting on Arsenal. You're not going to come and find an exclusive from Harry Simi very, very often. Um, that is something that isn't common knowledge that I'm the first one to break. What I do is I comment, comment, commentate, whatever you want to say on Arsenal. And my work is a little bit different. And so for me, there isn't a need to get bits of information or get leaks out of the club or build really, really strong bonds with sources so that I can be the first to break stuff because that's not what I do. But for some of those journalists who do have those relationships and do um, you know, rely on getting information early, getting good information early and then breaking that uh, to the wider world, they can't afford to ruin their kind of relationships with the club because the club have press officers. The club have people whose job it is to liaise with these guys. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the sources that they do use or that the sources that they quote are those press officers themselves feeding out what they want to feed out to those journalists and getting it put out into the, the wider world. So all I'm saying is those people those journalists that we're talking about, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because if they go in all guns blazing, antagonize Mikel Arteta, piss off the press officer, they're not going to get the stories that they get. Therefore, they're not as valuable to the journalistic world anymore, if that makes sense, as they were before. I'm not saying that's all they're good at, but it is a really big part of their job. And to tarnish that because someone with an anonymous name on Twitter and a dodgy avatar is telling them to, it's just nonsensical. So stop expecting that from some of the journalists because you're not going to get it. They are not going to damage their relationships and potentially damage their careers moving forward because 
so and so on Twitter is upset that they didn't ask a certain question or they, they didn't ask it in a certain way. So it's a really difficult balance to strike between asking those powerful and right questions, but also maintaining your relationship with the football club, especially if you're reliant upon that relationship for your work. So it's very, very, uh, it's a very, very tricky situation to be in. But the bit that really stuck out to me from that particular press conference was Mikel Arteta insisting that we need to maximise what we've got. Now, on the one hand, taking into account all of the things I've just said, I'm thinking to myself, well, he's not going to say we're going out and we're trying to sign X, Y and Z. Equally, he's not going to say what we've got at the moment is shit. It's not good enough. And we need to improve on it dramatically because that's not good for his relationship with his current crop. So he is, again, a bit like those journalists in a bit of a, you know, a weird space. That's not to say he's not to blame at all. That's not to say he's not accountable for where Arsenal are or partly accountable anyway for where Arsenal are. There's a lot of kind of issues at the football club right now that I think we're seeing come through. But... Don't read into that too much. It is a little bit concerning when you think that the season is just a few days away um, and we haven't done anywhere near as much business as we need to. But by that same token, Mikel Arteta, as as Paul points out um, in the comments, Arteta said he's been fully backed at the start. But now we have to sell Willock to get transfer funds, which will probably be spent on a backup goalkeeper instead of the midfield. But the key point from Paul's comment there is that Mikel Arteta has insisted that the club are backing him. Mikel Arteta has repeatedly said that he knows that the club are behind him and they're going to support him with whatever's possible in the transfer window. Well, if you're going to come out and make comments like that, a bit like Arsene Wenger, you're going to live and die by that because you know, you're you're going to die by the sword of Stan Kroenke because you've told everybody repeatedly that they are giving you what you need. You've told everybody that they are fully invested and engaged in bringing Arsenal back to where they need to be. But at the end of the day, I'm not saying you're going to come out and slag off your boss, but you, you lean too much one way and you've got a problem because you are then putting additional pressure on yourself that you don't really need. Mikel Arteta is under enough pressure as it is, but to constantly talk up the Cronkies at a time where the fans are very, very disconnected with them, very, very frustrated by everything they've done so far and their tenure so far, you're, you're just, as I say, piling the pressure onto yourself. And Mikel Arteta could have easily sat in a press conference and said, look, we're working really hard to do the business that we're going to do. And, um, you know, we'll do whatever's possible and we have to work within the finances of the club, et cetera, et cetera. He could have said that at the start of the summer. And I think there'd be a little bit more sympathy towards him. But again, has he been too loyal to them? A bit like Arsene was at certain times by kind of really going public and big on how good his relationship is with them. And is that going to come back and bite him in the ass? Looking at what we've seen so far, it probably will. Now. Moving on, a couple of the the um, the, the transfer rumours that I've seen emerge over the weekend. And of course, we haven't brought you one of these transfer talk shows since Friday, I think it was. Uh, of course, Arsenal are being linked with a move for Manchester City's Bernardo Silva. Now, I'm a big fan of Bernardo Silva. I think he's a really good player. I don't think he was as good last season as he was the season prior for Manchester City, but he is a really talented individual and he'd be a massive upgrade on a lot of the players that we've got at Arsenal Football Club right now. Pep Guardiola sat in front of the press on Friday and spoke quite openly about the fact that Bernardo Silva has asked to leave. Uh, the problem here is a couple of things. First of all, Bernardo Silva is not short of suitors in Spain. There are a number of clubs, including Atletico Madrid, who are said to be very keen on taking the Portuguese player uh, over to the Spanish capital. But the thing that works in Arsenal's advantage here, if indeed they do hold an interest in Bernardo Silva, is financially, you'd imagine, Arsenal would be in a better, stronger position to offer him not just wages, but to offer Manchester City the kind of fee that they'd be looking for. Pep Guardiola was very, very clear, wasn't he, in his comments. If the money comes in, these players can leave. If it doesn't, then uh, they're not going anywhere. So Arsenal will probably consider this one. We'll probably ponder over it. Mikel Arteta already has an existing relationship, doesn't he, with Manchester City and with Bernardo Silva. Will that play a part? 
Arsenal without Champions League football, though, is it as appealing to Bernardo Silva as some of the other options he may have on the table uh, might be? And so for me, it is one of those where we're going to have to overspend to land the player. If we really want the player, we're going to have to overspend. And when you're not in the Champions League and when you're not competing for the biggest trophies, the only way you can get the top, top players is by doing that, is by being crazy in terms of what you throw at them financially. Now, you know, it's the way Chelsea did it at the beginning. It's the way Manchester City did it at the beginning. Offer somebody enough money and they will consider it. It's the reality of the football world in 2021. Money does talk. And yes, Bernardo Silva could potentially join the Champions League club, could have his pick of a number of clubs because he is a very, very talented individual. But Arsenal, in my opinion, if they really want him, can make it happen. All you got to do is break the bank, break the bank and give the money, uh, you know, to Manchester City. Show them that you're serious and then show Bernardo Silva that you're serious with your contract offer. We've heard so much this summer about Arsenal really backing up uh, Mikel Arteta and they still might between now and the end of the window. But I understand the frustration right now uh, among fans when you look at how close we are to the Premier League season that we still look a shambles. When you look at the fact that Bayerin and Xhaka, based on what we saw yesterday, stand a really good chance of, of playing against Spurs, uh, sorry, playing against Brentford after they played against Spurs and two weeks ago, we thought they were both leaving the club. It just shows what a mess we're in, in terms of our plan. And, you know, I've always said it, Mikel Arteta and Edu might well have had a plan going into the summer, but they've not executed whatever that plan was up until this point. And it's a big problem. It's a big concern. But, you know, what have we spent? We've spent 75 odd million so far. Ben White came in for 50, Nuno Tavares. Uh, for about eight million, I think it was in Sambi Laconga, uh, cost us just under twenty million pounds, I think. So you're in a place where Arsenal have spent some money. They're about to recuperate twenty five million of that on Joe Willock, and I think they hoped that they were going to get twenty for Xhaka and maybe fifteen or so for Bellerin, which would have really bridged that gap. But it's that's not going to happen. So now we're going to see how much the Cronkies back the Arsenal. Now we're going to see if they really care. Are they going to dip into their pockets? or at least find a way in terms of restructuring finance, maybe to help Arsenal do the business they need. Now that those potential departures that we all thought were going to bring in big, big money look incredibly unlikely. So this is going to be the test. This is going to be the acid test. Do the Cronkies really back Mikel Arteta? Do they really care about the football side of things? Do they really care about getting Arsenal back to where they belong sooner rather than later? Well, if they do, they're going to have to put their hands in their pockets because their plan to shift off a number of players and bring in transfer funds as a result has failed. It has fucking failed miserably. And Arsenal are not, not going to get £20 million for Granit Xhaka this summer. They've just given him a new contract because they've realised that they can't afford maybe to go and spend, you know, £30, £35 million on his replacement. And that, for me, was the start of the warning signs. That, for me, was when the alarm bells started ringing. Not that I don't like Granit Xhaka, not that I think he's as bad as anybody thinks. I think, actually, he's a lot better than many people give him credit for. But the fact that Arsenal were willing to sell him and then didn't and then offered him a new contract says to me that the, the realisation of not being able to sell some of these players uh, for the money that we hoped has led to a bit of a backtrack and has led to Arsenal having to rethink their plans. And now all of a sudden buying a centre midfielder is not a priority and it's actually more cost effective to keep Granit Xhaka. That's the way I see it. And that was the beginning of the alarm bells for me. And now we're moving further and further down the window. Now we're hearing rumours that Bellerin might be getting a new contract. And that is a concern as well, because he clearly doesn't really want to be there. Um, you know, he's gone from being very close to an exit to now looking as if he's going to start our first Premier League game. So it just feels like all the plans have gone out the window for whatever reason, whether it's due to finance. I don't know, but it just feels like it's all gone to shit. And um, it is worrying. You know, there's no getting away from that. Whether you're the biggest Arteta fan or not, you can't deny that this is a really strange situation and a worrying situation. And I understand why people are upset and frustrated going into the new season. I really, really do. 
Moving on, we've also been linked with a move for Kieran Trippier. Why? We've still got a ton of right backs at the club. We can't shift Bellerin. Yesterday, we saw Maitland Niles come in at right back, who many of us were convinced didn't have a future in that position or doesn't even have a future at the club once away because of that very reason. He doesn't want to play at right back and he comes on as a sub against Tottenham in our last preseason fixture as a right back, lo and behold. So that means by my calculations, we've got Cedric Chambers, Maitland Niles and Bayer and four right backs at the club. Why are we being linked with a move for Kieran Trippier? I've said it before. Arteta may not look at his right back options and be totally happy with them at this moment in time. He may well look at them and feel like he needs to upgrade. But until we move some of them on, he is stuck. He is stuck with four right backs at the club and he's not going to be able to bring anyone in. Nobody significant anyway. Nobody that's going to um, require a big investment while he's got all those players on the books. It is impossible. It really, really is. And so to read that we'd been linked with Kieran Trippier for 30 plus million or whatever just seemed crazy to me. But I thought I'd bring it up and mention it to you guys because it was uh, quite widely reported over the weekend. It seems to have died down a little bit this morning, but it is a story that was uh, doing the rounds at the weekend. So um, there we go. Uh, so yeah, you know, lots to be worried about. Uh, but at the same time, Enjoy the fact that the season is around the corner or try to anyway, try to make the best of it. Get your fantasy football teams done. We're going to be dropping uh, a link to the league on Twitter in the next couple of days once I get around to doing it. Um, and look, let's look forward to the first game. And while a win at Brentford isn't going to make everything all right, it isn't going to kind of tell us that Arsenal are actually a much better side. We're talking about a newly promoted team. Um, I do expect them to give us a good game, but I also expect Arsenal to have enough to defeat them. You know, I'm not going to sit here at 10 o'clock on Friday night waxing lyrical about Arsenal if we do beat Brentford and telling you that we don't need any more business or that we don't need any more players in. But, you know, you get results and that stuff, you know, becomes less relevant. I think for me, with Mikel Arteta, we he's... We are hoping that his coaching is going to see improvements in the team. I know preseason hasn't shown us that, but we're hoping that once the season kicks off, we're going to see a bit of that. And that for me is massive. You know, a lot of it is going to be down to how well he coaches the team, how well he sets us up tactically, his team selections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you don't always fix everything by going and blowing loads of money in the transfer market. There are a number of clubs that can tell you that. Uh, from past experience, but it helps. And, you know, up until now, the coaching that we've seen has not necessarily been impressive enough to convince people that we are moving in the right direction. But look, let the Premier League kick off. Mikel Arteta is going nowhere. Get behind the team. Let's support them for the game at Brentford. Hopefully we're talking about a positive result on Friday night. And uh, fingers crossed, we still manage to get some business done. If not before the season kicks off, then at least by the time the window slams shut. So it's going to be a really, really important couple of weeks for Arsenal Football Club. It feels like this week is going to be a really long one, isn't it? With people kind of complaining and, and being frustrated and, and showing that ahead of the new season. Just enjoy the ride of the, the new season kicking off. It's always a buzz. Uh, that's the great thing about football. There's always next season to improve. And uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. Let's see how it goes. Right. Just a couple of quick reminders. First of all, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. We're approaching 15K here on YouTube and we'd love to get there sooner rather than later. Secondly, this show is sponsored by Manscaped.com. So for all your male grooming needs, head over to their website, check out their fantastic products. And if you enter our discount code, which is rolling across the bottom of the screen, 19 in 20, you'll receive 20% off of your order as well as free shipping. So it is worthwhile. Get involved and you stand to save yourself a fair amount of money whilst uh, I promise you, you're, uh, you'll are be looking a lot more neat, a lot more tidy, and I'm sure your partners will appreciate it. Maybe they'll even thank me. Who knows? Uh, there we go. So do check out Manscaped and we thank them for their very kind sponsorship. Also, if you haven't done so already, hit that like button. Why haven't you hit the like button yet? Uh, if you are one of the people that hasn't done it yet, let's check in where we are at the moment because there are already, um, how many, uh, 350 odd of you, uh, live 
with us right this moment in time but where are we in terms of likes let's have a quick look we are only on 72 surely we can get that up to 150 by the time the stream ends there is enough of you uh, to do that pop your questions in the chat as well we'll take a couple of questions uh, before we um before we uh before we let you go let's see um Let's pick out a few of these. Da, 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 just having a, a quick scroll through them and going to pick out a few here. Here we go from Vishal, one of our members. Thank you very much, Vishal. He says, why can't we buy before we sell? We don't do smart business either way. So we might as well address problems within the squad and then look at selling later on in the window. Surely we can afford it. See, this is the big problem, Vishal. I'm not sure that Arsenal can afford it. I am certain that when Arsenal were making their plans uh, for this summer, they banked on the likes of Bayerin and Xhaka moving on. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they banked on getting money for Joe Willock. I'm sure they banked on maybe moving Eddie and Ketia on as well. I'm sure that was part of the plan because it was in, uh, it was it was just weird. It just didn't sit right. How on earth were Arsenal Football Club, who had had to lay off staff and been really um, impacted by the COVID pandemic all of a sudden found 250 million pounds to throw at the transfer window. It was always a far-fetched idea. And I always said that a lot of that figure that had been quoted or reported was going to be made up of player sales. I also did a podcast a couple of, or it was probably a month ago now, where I valued all our current players. And I was told I was very modest in my valuation of some of those players. And we've not even been able to, uh, been able to achieve those valuations. So what does that tell you? I don't think Arsenal can afford it, Vishal. I really don't. I think that Arsenal bringing in big signings between now and the end of the window, in many ways, is dependent on us bringing in money from sales. And I think what you might see is a bit of panic at the end, and you might see the club throw a bit of weight behind the transfer. But I do think that they were banking on bringing in money for those players. It stuttered our plans. It's, by the way, this is not an excuse, right? This is still completely unacceptable on the club's part. It's still, for me, um, further evidence of how poorly the club's being run over the years. But the point I'm making here is that I do think they thought they were going to sell. I do think they thought they were going to bring in money and then they were going to use that money to try and, and bring in the players that they wanted. And the absence of that money coming in has caused them a big problem. It's why we can't get deals over the line. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think we can. I don't think we can afford it without sending. That's the big issue. Uh, Bonster says, where's Torreira? This is a really good question because Torreira posted something that indicated he was on holiday still. Uh, like within the last 24, 48 hours. And it's like, why? At, at the end of the day, we need midfield players. And Lucas Torreira is still better than a lot of the shit that we've got hanging around at the club at the moment. Why isn't Lucas Torreira back and part of the squad? Is a deal for him to move away imminent? Because we don't know about it. We haven't heard about it. And is that deal going to represent good value? Look, I know he's homesick. I know he doesn't necessarily want to be at Arsenal Football Club anymore. But tough shit, mate. You're under contract and you need to be back and you need to be training with a club. So I'd love to hear an explanation as to why Lucas Torreira is still on holiday, living it up, swimming in swimming pools in baking heat, while we're sitting here in the pissing rain here in London, worrying and stressing about what's going to happen to Arsenal next season. Um... What else have we got? Uh, a couple of you asking about sort of points tallies in the first few games. We'll we'll address that in the previews. We've got a few preview shows coming your way uh, this week. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, line on the dial says we failed to sign in key positions, but the lack of backup goalkeeper is a massive failing, surely for which heads should roll. We could end up badly exposed. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even... Um, and Leno's biggest fan, but we are one injury away from a flipping catastrophe. We really are. Uh, Tamina Ahmed says, any news on Bernardo Silva to Arsenal? No news at the moment. Uh, just reports that Arsenal are considering making a move for him, but nothing more than that. Uh, let's take this one uh, from Alex T. This is an interesting point. He says, how can some of you blame the current management for other clubs not wanting to buy our players? Or our players previously being given massive contracts and now not wanting to move. That is a great point, Alex, and it's spot on. I think you, you know, you can't blame Mikel Arteta for us being stuck with players that arrived long before he was in even in the frame for becoming manager. 
And you can't blame Edu for that either. But what you can blame them for is not anticipating the fact that clubs were not going to come in for these players because we could all sit. I mean, all right, I thought there would be takers for Bellerin. I thought there would be takers for a number of others. But I think it was quite clear early on that we were never going to get mega money from any of those players. And so, you know, we should have account- accounted for that. And and how do you account for that if your owners aren't willing to put funds in is the, is the million dollar question. But I've heard people co- kind of talking about financial fair play and that that's why we can't do this business and we can't do that business. Somebody go and tell Manchester City about financial fair play. They'll laugh in your face because there are ways around all that stuff as we've seen uh let's see what else we've got uh some of you saying that um Torreira is uh in madrid because of covid restrictions he can come back and isolate like everybody else he could should have been back ages ago you know bakayo saka went to the final of the euros and he's back already and he even played yesterday lucas Torreira's uruguay got dumped out of the copper america a while ago so why has he not come back even if he was in isolation, he'd have been back by now, surely. Um, John Daly says, thoughts on Eddie to Brighton. Willian not even on the bench where we ended up, Harry. Uh, both good points. Eddie and Ketty are being linked with a move to Brighton and Hove Albion. He's currently injured at the moment. I don't know if that's going to be a problem in that negotiation. But he's another one like Willock, who I don't see as part of the future at Arsenal. And if you can get a decent fee for him then take it move him on uh william not even on the bench that's correct william was not involved in the squad yesterday but apparently according to a journalist from uh goal in brazil he did train so it wasn't anything to do um it, it wasn't anything to do with uh with him not being fit or anything like that which is interesting does it mean a move for william is imminent who knows but he's another player that's been linked with a departure this summer we'd certainly save on the wage bill with him although we wouldn't really bring in a lot of money in terms of a transfer fee that's for sure uh so yeah both really good points and interesting uh points uh let's pick up uh some more uh of your comments before we uh we wrap up uh bonster says should arteta walk away if the board are not backing him absolutely absolutely and he should come out and say it that's what we want like i don't expect managers to slag off their employers during you know while they're working i don't expect that to happen you know while they're trying to have a working relationship you can't none of you would go into the public domain and slag off your bosses if you say you would you're a liar uh because nobody does that but in the event that it doesn't go well, then I'd like to see Mikel Arteta spill the beans so that then we can turn the anger back onto the people that actually deserve it. The people that are actually responsible for the, the way Arsenal have declined over the last few years. Because Arteta hasn't done a great job. Look, let's be honest, he hasn't done a fantastic job. But a lot of the issues that he is coming up up against and facing on a regular basis and having to deal with and having to navigate around are largely issues that were put in place or, or issues that were caused by the previous uh, by the previous kind of actions of the football club. So I've got sympathy for Arteta, but even still, he needs to do more. He needs to get more out of this team. This team on paper last season was better than a side that finished eighth. Um, you know, there were a lot of people that were looking around other Premier League squads and going, oh, they're better than us. They're better than... No, they fucking weren't. Let's be honest. You know, Arsenal were good enough in, on paper anyway to finish in that top six at the very, very least. And we failed to achieve that. So we really need to, to be better. We need to be better coached, better organised, and we need key players to step up at key moments. Unfortunately, we haven't seen much of that lately. You know, it's... it's um. It is a worrying time. Whatever way you try and dress it up or look at it, it is a worrying time. Uh, there was a really good question uh, that I've lost on the screen. I'm just trying to find it uh, because the chat is constantly updating. Uh, where is it? Something about um, something about what I would do with the money if we only had... I, I can't remember who wrote it. I do apologise uh, because the chat's updated so much I can't even scroll back that far. But uh, it was basically, if we had £60 million left in the transfer market, what would I do with it? Uh, and I guess for me, the position that we need a goalkeeper, we desperately need a goalkeeper. As I said, we're an injury away from a catastrophe in between the sticks. So we need to get a goalkeeper in, first of all. 
but I wouldn't be spending 20, 30 million on Aaron Ramsdale. No fucking way. First of all, I don't think he's that good. And second of all, I think there are far more pressing concerns. Remember, Arsenal aren't in Europe next season. So for me, go out and address the areas on the pitch that you need to. I've always been a big believer that rather than going and signing six, seven, eight players in a transfer window, you should go and sign two or three good ones who you know are going to improve your side and not take too many risks and not take too many gambles. So I'd rather Arsenal did that. I think we do need another creative player. That's really clear. I also think we probably need another centre midfielder as well. I think those two positions outfield are more important than the right back slot for me at this moment. Um, I'd love to upgrade on that in an ideal world, but I don't think it's going to happen. I'd like to upgrade up front as well, but I don't think that's going to happen either. So for me, the two positions or three positions that we have to address are centre of midfield, creative midfield, and a goalkeeper. And that, for me, is is key. You know, we have to do that business between now and when the window slams shut. Hopefully that business will be good enough. Hopefully that business will be the right business to take us forward. But it is so, so important uh, that we get that stuff done. Is it going to be done in time for Friday? I doubt it very, very much. But um, you know, let's go out there. Let's get our, our result. Let's turn in a good performance. We've got two very, very tough games coming up off the back of that. And so it's probably going to be a bit of a bumpy start to the season from an Arsenal perspective. There's no, uh, there's no doubt about that, but you know, let's, let's try and make the best of what we got and let's, let's go in and, um, and, uh, and start the season with some pride at least. And with some real kind of, um, you know, let's go and show that that, that all the it's, it's over to the players to show that they are behind Mikel Arteta. They keep talking about how much they are. Well, go and prove it. Go and give him everything. Go and play with a hundred percent desire, commitment. Execute his instructions to a T. If it doesn't come off, then the buck the buck stops with him. But go and give one hundred percent because I do think there's been times where he's been massively let down by players underperforming, making stupid individual mistakes. And uh, and that's that's been a big, big problem for Arsenal. But there we go. Uh, certainly plenty to be concerned about, but I'm sure uh, we're going to uh, have plenty more discussions uh, of that nature between now and Friday's Premier League opener. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. Please, please do hit the like button if you haven't already. If you'd like to go one further by supporting the podcast, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description. Subscribe, like, share, check out manscaped.com, our sponsors, and I'll be back very, very soon. In fact, later on today with more Arsenal talk. Until then, take care. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler and you're listening to Harry Simeon.